سورت الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد الله سبحانه وتعالى sent his deen so that it could be established he sent his law that it could be enforced in order for it to be enforced whoever is going to be in charge of the religion Whoever is going to be in charge of the deen must have the right from Allah to have authority over the people and to establish rule on the people. If the authority doesn't exist, if a person, he doesn't have the right to rule over the people, then he can never implement that law and he can never implement or enforce that uh, system. So this is a necessity in Islam, meaning for Islam to be established and to come to its full realization, then authority must be given to the rightful ruler. Now, the power of the ruler, the authority that he has is from Allah not from the people. And since the authority is from Allah, then people do not have the right to object. The people do not have the right to oppose such a ruler because of the fact that his appointment is from Allah. So if Rasulullah is appointed by Allah, then just like we don't have the right to oppose Allah, we don't have the right to oppose His Messenger. And just like the Imams have been appointed by Rasulullah, uh, hence we don't have the right to oppose the Imams. And anyone who is uh, a leader that the Imams have appointed, then in that case, uh, we will not have the right to oppose such a person also. Even though that person may not be masum, and he is not masum, we know that, that's a fact. The only masum are the Prophet and the Imams. Any leadership that comes after the Imams will not be masum. But the authority of that person who is not masum does not come from himself nor from us, but it comes from the Imam who is masum. Now here, just to go on from here, if the Imam, the last Imam, when he went into ghaybat, an occultation is in, and is inaccessible to the people now, in that situation, in whose hands did he leave this wilayat? Who has this authority? And what we mean by wilayat here, just let me explain to you this. What does a leader mean? What do we mean by leadership or authority or wilayat? What we mean by that is that who has the right to make decisions for others? You see, if I make a decision for you and say that, listen, I want you all to do this, then you can ask me a simple question is that, you know, who are you? What made you make decision for us? 
you have no right to make decision for me. You see, but if a child is there, if a son is there in the house of his father, and if the father makes a decision for his son, does the son have the right to ask this question to his father? You see, because there is a right there, that the father has the right to make the decision, he has the authority to make the decision for the children. And hence, this is wilayat. Meaning that wilayat is there where the father is able to make decision for his children. And is able to make a plan for them and say, listen, I'm, you're going to go to this school. Or you're going to do homework at this time. You're going to go to bed at this time. This is what you're going to eat for dinner. It is he has that father who makes the decision. And that decision when he makes it, he ha does he have the authority to make that decision or not? You see, this is why it is said that the father is the wali in the house. In the house where you have children, it is the father who is the wali. He is the making, he's making the decision. He has the authority to make the decision. And the children do not have the right to oppose him. They can let their views be known, but ultimately the decision is in the hands of the wali. Now, in such a situation, did Islam leave the ummats, the people, without a leader? Or no, did it give a way for us to uh, see who the leader is? Is there any... Uh, and this is where, for example, we need to understand this. Aqlan, we can, with reasoning, we can understand. Yes, there needs to be a leader. Is there a need for a leadership right now or no? That's the question. Or are we on our own and we can do what we want? Or all of us, us ummah, the believers, mu'mineen, are we on our own or is there someone that needs to be making decisions for us? Is there a need for leadership? If we say that there is no need for leadership, then the same reasoning should apply to Imamat also. Why is there need for Imam Ali to be the leader? Then what the Sunnis are saying is right, that Allah left it in the, His deen in the hands of the people. That they can do whatever they want with it, they can appoint who they want, they can choose who they want and live their lives according to the way they want to live. That's their reasoning of not accepting the imamat that is from Allah. And the reasoning we use in terms of imamat is what? That there needs to be a leader from Allah, not from us. He is the one who has to appoint a leader on the ummah, not us. We can't make our own leader. We can't choose our own leader. The same argument we use in imamat is the same argument that applies after imamat. If our last Imam went, then did he leave a way for us to make a leader or no? He said, this is in your hands and it, it, it's in your choice. You do whatever you want and I will see you when I come back. Right now Allah is taking me away and when I come back from Ghaibat, I will see you all. Until then, you know, just handle yourself, be careful. Is that the way of doing things? My friends, understand this. Uh, imams... If there was leadership that's going to come after Imamat. And again, my emphasis is this. We know that that leadership is not going to be Masoom. That's a fact. We know that. But now let's go forward than that. Okay, he's not Masoom. But did the Imams devise a leadership or not? Here's the question. And that's why the very fact that the Ghaibat... The occultation of the Imam is divided into two parts, Ghaibat al-Sughra and Ghaibat al-Kubra. Itself is showing that the first part of his Ghaibat was a training, the second part of a Ghaibat is reality. In Ghaibat al-Sughra and Ghaibat al-Kubra, what is the difference between these two Ghaibat? Between these two occultations? The difference is that in the first Ghaibat, Imam appointed someone as his Naib directly. He said, this is my Naib, this is my Naib. One after one, he appointed four Nawab, four Naib. 
right? In order that the people get used to the fact that this naib is your leader and he is not masoom and get used to listening to someone who's not masoom. Get used to listening to someone who's not masoom and paying attention to his orders and commands. Get used to that. And many people were saying, what, we're going to go to him now? What is the big difference, you know? Those people who lived in Ghaibat al Sughra, imagine what they went through. I mean, on one hand, you had Imam al Masoom that you can go and ask him questions and do anything you want and this and that, and mashallah. You know, and then all of a sudden, now you have to deal with his naib. You know, for example, let me, you know, give an example that, you know, we can understand and relate to uh, in our own self. Send me a salawat. You know, next Ramadan, inshallah, you know, uh, let's say that this community over here gets the opportunity and the chance to invite a very great ayatollah, alhamdulillah, a mushtahed and ayatollah. He says that I can come for the first 15 days of Ramadan. He said, great, you know, alhamdulillah. So now everyone is saying that, listen, ayatollah so-and-so is going to come over here and bow, bow, he's an expert and whatever, yeah, alhamdulillah. You know, so for 15 days, you know, he comes in Ramadan and everyone is like, alhamdulillah, so you know, attached and so much ruhaniyat and so much spirituality is there and this and that. And then after 15 days he leaves and after that, the only one you can get is me. Now when I come over here, you say, <laughs> listen, 15 days we had Ayatollah so and so. And now you got a student, you know. And he's trying to <laughs> appeal to the people and try to lecture to the people and saying 15 days we had an ayatullah here and now we have to deal with him. <laughs> right? Now you have to deal with me. 15 days. Imagine what kind of a difference would that be? Just imagine what kind of difference would that be? You know, you were asking questions on Ayatullah and you see that his replies and the way he replied and there was so much confidence this and that and here a student comes along and he's saying whatever that he wants to. Right? And he goes on saying this. <laughs> now what happens? My friends, it's a big drop. And you'll be shocked. I mean, now we have to listen to him for 15 days? After listening to them for 15 days? So you see, the same kind of shock occurred when the people who lived in, who lived in Ghaibat al Sughra, to them the same sort of shock of, uh, occurred to them. On one hand, they were dealing with Imam Masoom, who was, you know, Imam, who has ilm of ghaib, who has ilm that is able to satisfy you, content you, and now they have to deal with this naib, Hussain ibn Ru. So, Hussain ibn Ru, you know, uh, what's your name again? Hussain ibn okay, good to know you, you know, and you are what? Naib, okay, uh, where's the Imam? He said, well, I can't tell you, he's there, you know, but... So I can't meet him? No, you can't. You have to meet me. I can't ask him a question? No, you ask me the question. Oh, that's a big shock. It had a big drop. So obviously the drop was there. But you see, Ghaibat al-Sughra, what was it meant for? If it wasn't meant for introducing the new leadership to the people, then what was it for? What is it for? So that the people can use to having a leadership that is different than what the Imams are. Because it is not something that is ideal, it is something that is out of necessity. My friends, ita'at is meant for ulul amr who are imams. But when the imam is not here, then that ita'at is for a person who is other than an imam, other than masoom, but with this grain of salt added into it, that yes, he is not going to be like the imam. He is not going to be in that situation. But then, does the obedience change? Now do we tell Hussain ibn Nur, listen, you know, you know, I like you, I think you're a good speaker, I think you're very handsome and all that, but I can't listen to you. I can't listen to you. Would, do you think this excuse would be accepted by the Imam? 
If the Imam has appointed someone and you don't listen to him, what is happening here? It means you're not listening to the Imam. This is what happens. The, the, after the Imams, they had left a system for us. They said that the hukumat is necessary, hakim is necessary. Rule is necessary, ruler is necessary. This we have understood. Now who can be that ruler? That is the only thing that we are discussing right now. Who can be that ruler? Who has wilayat over whom? Who has the right to make decisions for others? Obviously the Imam doesn't appoint anyone after Ghaib al Sughra. No one is appointed by the Imam. No one is appointed by the Imam. But if the Imam doesn't appoint someone, does it mean that the Imam didn't give us a way of selecting him? The Imam didn't give us a way or not? That is the thing. Now, until now I avoided Hadith. Because I didn't want to go to Hadith. But I'll mention one or two Hadith so that this meaning that I've just said could be understood by you from the Imams themselves. You send me a loud salawat. <laughs> Imam Jafar Sadaq alayhi salam asked this question, it's a rhetorical question, to his companions. Right? And I'm just mentioning if, you know, one or two hadiths so that you get the idea of what I'm saying from hadith. Because what I'm saying, I'm explaining to you through reasoning so you understand it through hadith also and through nas what I'm saying. He posed a rhetorical question and he said that Is it possible for Allah to leave a society without a wali, a guardian? Is it possible that Allah leaves a society without a wali? In any time, any age, is, there any, is it possible for that to happen? Obviously the Sahaba didn't say anything, companions didn't say anything. He says, then the Imam says he never did so. And never will he do it. In other words, there will always be a wali who's going to be there for people to obey and to do itaat of. There will always be a wali in that sense. In Nahjul Balagha, we see that we have uh, from um, Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam in sermon number 110. This is uh, saying number 110 for those who want to go back and look at it and do their own research on it so that they can also learn from their book. He says that no one should take on the responsibility of establishing Allah's government and rule except he who neither compromises nor yields to humiliation nor follows his own temptations. Meaning that the rule of Allah should be established and the person who should establish that must have these qualities. In other words, he is giving us a criteria and a standard by which we choose and that we uh, identify that person. Because our job is not to choose someone from amongst us. Our job is to identify in the ghaybat, identify the qualities in the person. If we see these qualities in a person, then it means that that person is what? He is the wali over us. It is guardianship. Now, when we look at these qualities that the Imams gave us to identify, what are these qualities? My friends, the first quality, the first sifat, the first attribute to look at in a leader, in a wali, is ilm, is knowledge. First thing you look at is knowledge. Uh, and what do we mean by knowledge? Which knowledge should he have? Do you have the knowledge of uh, medicine, engineering, architecture, fiqh? What is the knowledge that he should have? This is something that we need to understand. My friends, let me tell you. Whatever you want to establish, whatever it is, whatever goal of that establishment is, that person should be the most knowledgeable in that. Simple as that. Tell me. If you want to establish a hospital and open a hospital, you know, you go, let's say, back home and you say that you have money, you know, 
I came back with millions of dollars, I want to make a hospital. Now, let's say you go to the holy city of Najaf and say that, you know what, I'm going to establish a hospital here. And you make the hospital. Now you want to appoint someone to be in charge of the hospital. Tell me, would you choose an ayatollah and say that, listen, you need to be in charge of all the doctors and explain to them what they should be doing here. Would you go and ask an ayatollah to be in charge of the hospital? You know, and ayatollah himself will say, listen, you know, when I get sick, I'll come to the hospital, but don't put me in charge of the sick. <laughs> I, when I'm sick, I'll come to your hospital, but he said, I don't know what to do with the sick people here. If you want to establish a hospital, you will look for someone who is good in medicine so that when he establishes a system in the hospital, he knows that how to take care of patients, how to look after them, how to do all the procedures that are necessary to take care of patients. That's the goal of the hospital. So when you want to establish a hospital, you don't look for a faqih and say that, listen, you are the faqih and Imam said that you, know, you have to be our leader. Not in this. It's not for a hospital. Or for example, you want to uh, have an like, engineering firm where you build bridges. Right? Now you're going to like, invite a like, mullah to go there and say that, okay, you be in charge of the bridges. You tell me how many of those bridges will last. <laughs> you know? My friends, the thing is that when you want to establish that, you don't hire him. The issue is, what do you want to establish? What do you want to establish? That's the issue. Allah, when He speaks about Islam, did He send Islam to be an amusement for you so that you can listen to it and be happy? Or was His goal to establish Islam? Allah has sent the Prophet and the book to do what? So that it could be established amongst all other religions. It could be established. The goal of Islam is to establish Islam, to establish its law, to implement its law. So when we as mu'mineen want to implement Islam as a way of life, when we want to implement the laws of Islam and the laws of shari'at in our lives and in the society, then we look for the person who is knowledgeable in shari'at and the law and in the deen of Islam. This is the first condition. Why? Because you want to establish Islam. If you want to establish Islam, then look for a alim. If you want to establish hospital, look for a doctor. If you want to establish an engineering firm, look for an engineer. If you want to establish democracy, look for crooks and criminals. But if you want to establish Islam, then you need the best and the most knowledgeable in Islam in order to establish it. So the first uh, quality, the first sifat of that guardian is what? Is that he should be knowledgeable in Islam. That he should have ishtihad, he should have the ability to know what Islam is. This is the first quality, there are other qualities also, but the first quality, since fiqh is the first quality, that's why the concept is called wilayatul faqih. Fiqh is one quality, the most important quality, because faqih, you need to be a faqih, that's why it's called wilayat e faqih. That it is the faqih who has the authority to make decisions for others. It is the faqih who has the authority to make that rules for others. If he, if, if you want to establish something else in your land, democracy, as I said, you know, go ahead, you know, Shalabi and Bola, all these other people are there, ready, waiting in line, you know with their tricks and their bags, you know, to come and rule over you. They're all there. But if you want to establish Islam, then Islam has a standard. This you need to look at someone. So now when you look at fiqh, now one, one thing here very simply I want to put to, to words here. My friends, the basic meaning of vilayat al faqih is what? Very simply said. And this is very simply I'm saying. The basic meaning of wilayat al faqih is that the alim has the wilayat over the jahil. In the ghaibat of the imam. That is all it means. Because there are only two choices we have. Either the jahil, the ignorant, rules over the alim, or the alim rules over the ignorant. 
Which one is right? Tell me which one is right? It's the alim, right? That rules over the jahil. This is what Islam has said. That the alim has awlawiyyat. He has, uh, he has more right to rule over the jahil than the jahil rules over the alim. Anyone who says, I don't believe in wilayat al is saying, okay, if you don't believe in wilayat al then the jahil has the right to rule over the alim. Is that right? Well, no. Well then, my friends, no one can deny that wilayat has for the alim, is for the faqih over the jahil. That is a basic principle of Islam. It is aqlan as well as shar'an. There is a basic principle of Islam that the alim is the one who has to rule over the jahil. In anything, it's natural. I gave you many examples before. If I'm sick right now, who I'm going to ask? I'm going to ask all you people or a doctor. You see, it's the alim that I have to go back to and say that, listen, please tell me what should I do. It's very simple, my friends. The issue about wilayat al faqih is what the faqih is in charge of the people. The one who is the alim is in charge of the people. Let me explain this point, inshallah, in detail so that we understand this very well. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. My friends, in order to oppose Islam, in order to oppose Islam, shaitan has always worked to bring about something else as an alternative to give to the people. Because if he says, don't take Islam, he needs to offer something in return, right? If he doesn't offer anything in return, hey, you know, for example, if I'm eating, let's say, Snickers, and shaitan doesn't want me to eat Snickers, and he wants me to eat a lollipop, I mean, he just can't come to me and say, hey, don't eat the Snickers. I'll say, well, what should I eat? Then he'll give me a lot. He'll eat the lollipop. So, see, the, all, the alternative has to be there. If shaitan doesn't all, offer an alternative, then you know what? We'll all be in Islam. He'll be like, hey, listen, if you don't have anything to offer, it, go away. I'll just take whatever Islam is giving me. You see, when shaitan wants to uphold Islam, he offers an alternative. If there is no alternative, then obviously no one's going to listen to him. And throughout history, we see this all this alternative that always came about, right? When the Ambiya were there, right? Then you had like, for example, these false gods like Fir'aun and Namrud and these people. And we see that when Imamat was there, then he came about with Khilafat and say, "Hey, lollipop, you know." To the people. If he didn't offer that, you know, then everyone would be with Imam Ali, right? It's because he offered that lollipop that everyone went to that lollipop, right? But everyone, you know, would have stick to Imam Ali if that lollipop wasn't there, right? And the same thing went forward. It came forward now. Now what happened is this. When the authority is for the alim, now... Uh, Shaitan had to offer an alternative. So his alternative, which is a very good one, to say the least, at least in slogan. Right? Why? Because it has many people fooled. Just like Khilafat had many people fooled. Just like those gods had many people fooled. When Fir'aun announced, Ana Rabbukum al-A'la. Tell me my friends, when he announced that, really, the people believed in him, right? They said, wow, he's God. He's God. You know, they believed in him. But Musa came and said that, listen, I'm a messenger from Allah. So, you know, they're saying, hey, listen, I didn't send you. You know, what are you talking about? I'm God. You know, I'm God. You know, what are you talking about? I'm the one in charge. I'm God. So, here, when those people who are objective standby spectators, like us, we are looking at these two big wigs trying to go in the bout. And one of them is saying, Ana Rasulullah, I'm the messenger of Allah. And the other was saying, Ana Allah. So you're saying, okay, who should I believe in? The messenger of Allah or Allah? My friends, yeah, as a spectator, you're looking at this choice you have to make. So obviously that choice is an attractive choice. Otherwise, why would people go there? So my friend, all the time, shaitan offers the slogan to us. And the slogan is an alternative to what Islam is saying. 
Now, what is that slogan today that shaitan is offering and is making many people look at that slogan even when you look inside it, it's completely anti-Islam. But it got Muslims so much fool that they say this is a part of Islam also. And they don't understand completely at all what that slogan stands for. And that slogan that shaitan is offering is called democracy. That's the slogan shaitan is offering to the people of the world right now, is democracy. And people, when they look at democracy, they have no clue what democracy is. They have no idea what it stands for. They have no idea what is the relationship of that with Islam or with Allah. But they say that, oh, we, you know, great slogan. So let me just explain what democracy is so that you understand what Islam is. Send me a salawat. My friends, democracy simply means the rule of the people. The rule of the people. Meaning, you know, in the old days, Shaitan used to make false gods. You know, Fir'aun, the sun, the moon, you know, the cow, whatever. He made false gods. And people used to worship those false gods. Then he became better at it. He said, listen, why should I make these false gods where people will bow down to them? No. Ultimately, I'll make a god that is truly better than all those false gods. What is that? He said, listen, the cow is not god. The moon is not god. The sun is not god. So who's god? You are god. You are God. You rule. You are the one who rules. Now Allah has warned us about this. Many years ago in the Quran. He says, Afaman ra'ita in ittaqaza ilahuhu hawa. Have you seen him who has taken his hawa to be his God? His opinions to be his God. His view to be his God. What is that? Meaning that your view is God. Meaning your view rules. Your view should be the authority. My friends, democracy all it means is the rule of the people. Meaning you decide what is right and wrong. You are in charge. You are in charge. So now when you are in charge, so now tell me, you are there and I am there. We both are there. Uh, when we were all together, now who's in charge? He said, listen, if all of you are together, because really, if I am God and you are God, and we all gods get together, so now what? How do we decide then? See, there's a problem now. I'm not living alone in this world. I'm not living in a cave where no one sees me, I don't see anyone. I live with people. I interact with people. If I'm living with people, and we are all God, if we are all God and if our view is the view and if our opinion is the right opinion, then how do we decide on doing something in that, in that situation? Well, it says, well, wherever most of the gods go, then that will be the right thing to do. Right? That will be the right thing to do. Well, how are we going to decide that? Well, now we'll make a new thing, something called elections. Let's make this up, elections, where all the guards come together and they give their view. And whichever side has the view of most of the guards will prevail over the others. So now we all decided to do what? To have an election. And in the election what happens? I cast a vote and you cast a vote. When both of us cast a vote, what's happening, my friends, here? I say yes, you say no. So my vote is being cancelled by your vote. Meaning our opinion is the same. What democracy has done, it has brought all the opinions of everyone at the same and equal level. So now on the outward, it looks great. Wow, subhanallah. You see, now we are all equal. We are truly now equal. Why? Because your opinion has cancelled my opinion. My opinion has cancelled your opinion. Right? So what it means is that we are all equal now. 
So this is what makes democracy very attractive to people. That everyone's opinion is the same. No one's opinion is greater than the other. Every one of us, whatever view we give, whatever vote we give is the same as the other. It's not like, for example, if I vote, I get two votes and you get one vote because I'm richer than you are. It doesn't work like that. Right? The way it should work, ideally, is what? Is that my vote is equal to yours, yours is equal to mine. My friends, if you understood this part of democracy, this is the most attractive part of democracy and this is the most un-Islamic part of democracy also. This is where Islam differs from this. My friends, when all of us are equal, when all of us are equal, so now what happens? That my view is equal to your views, no higher than your view. So you can, so you tell me, hey, listen, you have a right to your view? Great, have a right to your view. You have a right to your view? Yes, you have a right. Do I have a right to my view? I have a right to my view. Why? We are all equal, our views are equal. My view cannot supersede yours, your view cannot supersede ours. So now what happens? If all our views are equal, if we are all at the same level, so when Imam Zamana comes to us, so we will say, Imam, you have a right to your view? I have a right to my view. Rasulullah, you have a right to your view? I have a right to my view. Why? Because we are all equal. When you cast a vote, your vote is same as mine. It's not that, for example, when Imam Zamana comes, he will have 100 votes and you have one vote. Would that happen? No, it won't. Right? His vote is equal to your vote and hence his opinion is equal to your opinion. Your opinion is equal to his opinion. If Allah says something in the Quran, says, well, Allah has a right to his view. You know, he has a right to his view. But I don't agree with it. Allah has a right to his view. Tell me, my friends, if all our views are equal, where does God fit in this? Where does Rasulullah fit in this? Where does Waliullah fit in this? You see, that's why those people who say that democracy is a part of Islam do not understand that Islam has no place in democracy. Islam has no place in democracy. Why? Because it is Allah's view that is truth. Everyone's view is useless. You know, uh, views of people, right? We all have views. And everyone has their own different views. But is our view truths? No, our view is based on our ignorance. It is Allah's view that is the truth. And hence when He says something, Allah He says that, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَدَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْقِيَرَى when Allah and His Messenger decide on a subject, then Mu'mineen have no qiyar, no ikhtiyar, no choice in that matter, but to submit to it. Why? Because His view is not a view, His view is the truth. My friends, to us, what is Allah's view matters, not what our view matters. Understand, this is the first flaw and the first place where we understand that, listen, this has nothing to do with Islam. Islam is to see what Allah says, what His Messenger said, what His Imam says. Not what we say. Not what our view is. You know, I'll read a quote for you, just to lighten up things over here. You know, I don't know if you all know who Clint Eastwood is. You know, Clint Eastwood is the guy who used to act in Western films. You know, that guy. You know, this is, a, this is a quote from him. Right? And I'm going to just rephrase the quote so it becomes decent for the member to be said on. He says that opinions are like your rear end. I'm rephrasing it. Opinions are like your rear end. Everyone has them and they all stick. Then why? Because my friend, I just gave this quote. Salawat ala Muhammad. The reason is because of the fact that our opinions are based on ignorance. Our ignorance. We don't even know about our own self. Let us know about others. 
what to do for others. This is our opinions, my friends. Whenever we give opinions, this is what happens. And hence, when Allah gives a view, then that is the truth. We look for it and we submit to it. This is called Islam. When Rasulullah says something, we look for what he said. And when Rasulullah said it, I submit to it. I change my thinking to fit his thinking. When the Imam says something, I change my view to fit his thinking, submit to his view. Why? Because I know that his view is the truth. My view is just ignorance. Ignorance must submit to knowledge, not knowledge submitting to ignorance. This is one way. Now, let me give you another example. The same thing. If we extend this argument. Now, we come to an election. The same thing I was saying about, about democracy. I give a vote, you give a vote. We cancel each other. I say yes, we need to elect him. You say no, someone else. I am a completely ignorant high school dropout who doesn't even know how to do my own stuff. I don't even know how to read and write correctly. I don't even read the newspapers. I don't know what's happening in the world. Nothing. Complete ignorant person I am. And you are an alim. Someone who's observant, someone who's wise, someone who understands issues, someone who knows what's right and wrong. I am saying yes, you are saying no. In other words, you being an alim, you being someone who's knowledgeable, your view is being cancelled by the view of the ignorant. So what's happening here? What democracy does, what election does, it makes the alim equal to the jahil. It does what? It makes the alim equal to the jahil. You and alim have been contradicted by me as a jahil. And because of my ignorance, I destroyed your ilm. Destroyed the effects of your ilm. This is what democracy does. And democracy is saying, no, all of your views are the same, whether you are an alim or a jahil. And what does Allah say now? What does Islam say now? Are they who know equal to those who know? They can never be equal. Allah is saying that the alim can never be equal to the jahil. And democracy is saying, no, the alim is equal to the jahil. Understand this my friends, how Islam is working and how these people are thinking, what this way is. They can never be equal, Allah is saying. Islam is saying they can never be equal. Elections are saying no, they can be equal and they are equal. You have just made them equal. You destroyed the ilm of the alim with the jahl of the jahil. You have destroyed the knowledge of the scholar with the ignorance of this ignorant person. That's what you have done. So the first issue, my friends, that Islam has said is what? That the first sign of a leader, the first preference that Islam gives is to knowledge. When someone is knowledgeable in Islam, when someone is a faqih, then and then only can he become the wali with the other conditions that are there. This is the first quality. This is the first quality, you understand? Where Islam is and what the system of vilayat al faqih is. The first quality in looking for a leader, when you see someone who has ilm, then the uh, ring or of uh, choices that you have is limited. For example, how many Shias are there in the world? Because I'm not mentioning many other things that are mentioned, because obviously Allah has mentioned the preference of Iman over not Iman. So when we are saying a leader, so it has to be a mu'min then first. He has to be mu'min. Then he has to be muttaqi. Inna akramakum in dallahi atqaakum. Whoever is the most muttaqi is preferred over non-muttaqi. So first a mu'min. That's why we're looking at only mu'mineen. How many mu'mineen are there in the world? Take a wild guess. No. I don't know. 150 million, 200 million? 200 million let's say. I'm, I'm just giving a figure. 200 million, right? 200 million mu'mini. So if a leader has to be there, it has to be one of these 200 million people, right? The right or not? Yes. Now Allah says, the next quality is ilm. Now we come to ishtihad. How many of these 200 million are mushtahad? Okay, now it has come down very much, right? Let's say 1,000. Let's say 1,000. I'm giving a figure out there. Right, 1,000. So now the choice of leadership is limited to 1,000 now. 
because of this criteria of ill. Now let's go to the second criteria, my friends. And the second criteria, this is mentioned, you know, I'm not saying these criteria, I'm saying the Quran, what the Quran is saying. What are the preferences Allah gives in the Quran to the people? The second preference that Allah gives, other than ill now, now we have made that leadership come to only 1,000. Out of 1,000 you need to choose now. You know, you need to make sure that this is out of these 1,000, not more than that. Because these are the mushtahid, these are the ones who are knowledgeable about Islam. Alhamdulillah, we came down to that. The second criteria Allah gives in the Qur'an is the criteria of jihad. Criteria of jihad. Allah gives this in the Qur'an. He says, هَلْ يَسْتَفِ الَّذِينَ قَائِدُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ غَيْرُ أُولِ الدَّرَرِ وَالْمُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ عَلَى الْقَائِدِينَ دَرَجَةً My friends, this is the second standard. He says, second standard you look at, 1,000 mujtahideen, 1,000 ulama, out of those 1,000 ulama who are doing jihad and who are sitting down. This jihad is what? He's saying this jihad is غَيْرُ أُولِ الدَّرَرِ Meaning that those who are not doing jihad who are sitting down. What does that mean? They are harmless. They're not ruffling any feathers. Right? They're not pushing any zalim. They're not doing anything. They're just hanging out there and saying that, okay, let we a rule and inshallah, you know, we'll do our job. You know? We'll do our job, we won't cause any harm to anyone, we won't rock the boat, we won't shake anything, we will not cause any zarar to anyone. Now obviously, one of the signs of a mu'min is that he doesn't cause zarar to anyone. Sign of Iman. It is said by uh, our Imams and Rasulullah that the sign of a mu'min is that he his hands and his tongue should not be harmful for anyone. Everyone should be safe from his tongue and his hands. This is a sign of mu'min. But to whom? To other mu'mineen? To other people? Or this also extends to zalimin also? This also extends to, you know, to those who are oppressing others, to tyrants. So if you see a tyrant, you say, listen, I should not cause any harm to him from my tongue and my hand because that is the sign of a mu'min. Or does the, are the, does the rule change when it comes to those who are zalim? Does the rule change when it comes to those who are taghut? I mean, friend, friends, we need to be realistic and understand this. But Allah says that those who are sitting down, who are harmless to others, they are not equal to those who are doing jihad in Allah's way. So what does this jihad in Allah's way entail? In other words, what it entails from this ayat is that they're causing harm to those who are zalim. They're causing harm to the ta'ud. They're not sitting down, they're causing harm to them. This is what it means. So now those people who are doing that job, how are they doing that job? Let me explain it in my own way if you send me a lot of salawats. My friend, I said that Imam Zaman in his Ghaibat al-Sughra appointed Na'ib. After, after Ghaibat al-Sughra, he did not appoint any Na'ib. But he left a standard for us to choose one. Who is doing the Niyabat of the Imam? Who is the Na'ib of the Imam in his Ghaibat? I'll give a very simple standard to you so that it could be understood by everyone. Very easy standard. And that standard is that whoever is doing the job of the Imam in his ghaibat better than anyone else. Whoever is doing the job of the Imam in ghaibat better than everyone else, he would be the naive then because he is the best at doing the job that the Imam is supposed to do. Very simple. Just look around and see who is doing the job of the Imam in his ghaibat better than anyone else. Alhamdulillah. When you see that, then you know that Alhamdulillah, he is the one. He is naib, right? Now, 
The only question is, what is the job of the Imam? What is the job of the Imam? Tell me, is his job to give speeches and lectures? When the Imam will come back, will he be known for giving speeches and lectures? If his job is to give speeches, then the best speaker should be Naib. See who's getting the most money for speeches. Oh, he's getting $1,000 a night. Ah, he must be Naib then. Why? Because the Imam's job is giving speeches, right? If the Imam's job is giving speeches, then the best speaker should be Naib. If the Imam's job is writing books, then the best author should be Naib. Oh, this alim has written 1,000 volumes of book. So, we'll say Alhamdulillah, he has to be the Naib. Why? Because the Imam's job is to write books. He will be writing books. Subhanallah. So, if that's the case, then he should be the Naib. Isn't it? If the job of the Imam is to give classes and to teach people, then the best teacher should be the Naib. Then the best teacher should be the Naib. Meaning that he is the best teacher, he has the most students, his Dars Kharij is the best, and you know what? He has, you know, so many students in Dars Kharij, he must be the Naib of the Imam. He must be the Naib of the Imam then. Very simple. All we need to decide is what is the job of the Imam. My friends, neither is the Imam coming to give speeches. Neither is the Imam coming to give lectures. Neither is the Imam coming to write books. Neither is the Imam coming to teach at all. In fact, let me quote a hadith here just for your information. When Imam Zamana will reappear, Everyone who's of the age of 20 years, is written in Rewaid, 20 years is Shiroon Asana. Everyone who's at the age of 20 years, who doesn't know Haram and Halal, who doesn't know what is Wajib and what is not Wajib and what is Haram, he doesn't know that, he doesn't have knowledge of that. Imam is not going to teach them, he's going to behead them. He's going to cut their heads off. He's not coming to teach anyone. Don't expect that when Imam will come, he'll write his Tawzi'ul Masahil. Imam is not coming to write Tawzi'ul Masahil. He is not coming to teach people fiqh. That would already have been done by ulama. They have already taught people what is right and wrong, what is haq and batil, what is wajib and not wajib. They have written that down. Imam, then why are you coming? What is your job? What is your occupation when you come? How many hadiths do we have from the Prophet till your 11th Imam? Explaining what the Imam is going to do. Imam is coming back to do two things. And you all know this and you have heard this so many times. I'm just going to reveal it for you my friends. Two things he's going to do when he comes back. He's going to fight against Zulm. He's going to establish Adal. This is what he's going to do. Where? Every place you read hadith about the Imam coming back, what does it say? That he's going to establish justice, he's going to establish adal, and in saw where there was zulm and jawr. Isn't that what it says in the hadith? How many hadiths are there regarding that? Every place is saying that the job of the Imam is two. He's going to fight zulm, he's going to establish justice. So this is the job of the Imam. If the Imam's job is this, then anyone in his ghaibat who is doing that more than anyone else should be the naib of the Imam. Anyone who's doing that more effective than anyone else should be the naib of the Imam. Because that is the job of the Imam. That's what the Imam is going to do when he comes back. So my friends, jihad is the second thing. Allah says those who do jihad, do not compare them to those who are sitting down. They're different. It, now, it doesn't mean that they're bad. My friends, understand this. Those who are sitting, it doesn't mean they're bad. Do not take it in that meaning. Allah says that there's a daraja of difference between the mujahideen and qaideen. He's not saying that the qaideen are bad people and evil people. No, they're also good. They're also good, but those who are jihad are different. You have to regard as a moment if you believe in the Quran and read the Quran, that those who are doing jihad are higher than those who are not doing jihad. 
We have to understand that. We have to believe in that. Because Allah is saying that in the Quran. And it only makes sense. It only makes sense for us. Why? Because you see that person who is fighting zulm and he's trying to establish adal. As opposed to those who have the opportunity but they're not doing it. It doesn't mean that they're bad. It doesn't mean they're bad. And this is where we have to be very careful. You know, I don't want you to point, start pointing fingers. And, oh, he's sitting down doing nothing. Now, Baba, don't look at it that way. Look at it this way, that the one who's doing jihad, where he is. Don't look at those people who are not doing jihad. Look at the one who is ruffling the feathers that the zalameen are against them. I said last year when I spoke about shaitan over here. And I'll repeat that here and I'll end my speech here. Tomorrow inshallah we'll go into other details. My friends, last year I mentioned this. There are many people who claim that we are with Allah and Allah is with us. Alhamdulillah. You are on sirat mustaqim great. Alhamdulillah. We are good for you. Right? And inshallah, we all are on sirat mustaqim Right? But my friends, how do you know if you're on sirat mustaqim And I'm getting this as a result of all the ayat and hadith. I don't have time to go into all the ayat and hadith regarding this. I'm just giving you the conclusion right here. How do you know that you're on sirat mustaqim Who does Allah like? Do you know who Allah likes? Other than Ahlul Bayt that Allah has mentioned them in the Quran, Alhamdulillah we know that. Because Allah has revealed His feelings, He has revealed Himself about Ahlul Bayt. But amongst the Mu'mineen, amongst us, amongst ulama, who is it that Allah likes? Do you know that? Does anyone know that? No one knows it. No one knows who Allah likes. Really no one knows who Allah likes. So how do we know who Allah likes more? I'm just giving you the conclusion of many ayat and hadith together. And you can do your research on it and you can go and see it. How do you know who Allah likes the most? My friends, understand this. You won't know who Allah likes by looking at Allah because Allah is not telling anyone who He likes. That is vague, that is ambiguous. Allah is keeping it a secret. But the only way for you to know how much you are liked by Allah is to see how much shaitan hates you. If you get to know that shaitan hates you, then, they, then you know that Allah likes you. Shaitan's hatred is a sign of Allah liking you and you being in the good books of Allah. Because shaitan is never against those who are with Allah or Allah likes. He will always be against those who Allah loves. That's why if you see that shaitan is against someone, more than anyone else, then you know that this person must be doing something right, so that shaitan is so much upset with him. This person is doing something, that's how you get to know how, who, who Allah likes. There's no third way for you to know that. There's no way else to know that. The only way to know is shaitan. Shaitan, tell me, what is your media saying about so and so? What is your outlet saying about so and so? What are your departments of intelligence saying about so and so? So you hate him so much. Why do you hate him so much for? Why do you hate him so much for? Uh, did he run away with your daughter? Did he took your money? My friend, understand this. You get to know about Ali when you see Muhammad's hatred for him. You get to know about Hussein when you see Yazid's hatred for him. This is how you know, Subhanallah, so much hatred, so much animosity for what? Imam Hussein asked the same question in Karbala, what did I do to you? D did I take your money? Did I harm any one of you? Did I do anything wrong to you? Why is this hatred for? You see my friends, this is important to understand. Naib of the Imam is someone who's doing the work of the Imam in the ghaibat of the Imam. First, this is the second standard Allah gives. One was ilm, the other is jihad. Right? Now there are others. Inshallah, you know, we want to go forward. We have three, four more days left. 
and I want to see how much I'm able to get you to understand and to uh, reach a final conclusion as to what it is today. So inshallah, we will leave that for tomorrow and day after tomorrow, inshallah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a tawfiq and a blessing to be on the right path. Wisdom to understand his guidance. Hasten to be a prince of Imam. Make us his helper when he comes. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We have a question right away. Go ahead, sister. Uh, I can't hear you, sister. You need to come a little bit forward. The hadith is in that. Well, uh, it's in uh, uh, Bihar and Anwar. It's uh, uh, Bihar and Anwar. It's in uh, uh, Sheikh Saduq's book. Right? It's, uh, it's in Kitabul Awail. Right? To say a few. But it's a well known hadith amongst us. Right? And the fact is, when he comes back, it's not a time for teaching anymore. You, you only have time until he returns. When he returns, it's over. Now Allah wants to establish His rule, no matter what. Because of the fact that He's giving five years time after a person becomes baliq to learn. That is the mercy of Allah. He's giving you that much time. So if you haven't learned from your parents, at least you will learn on your own. Why? Right? That time is being given to you. So that you yourself can learn what is wajib and what is haram and what is halal. If a person by that age doesn't even care about that, then when the imam comes, there is no turning back. When the imam comes, there is no turning back. This is why everyone should know, because it means that a person doesn't even care. If he doesn't even care, when the imam comes, he will be on the opposite side. He'll be on the opposite side. He won't be there with the imam saying that, Imam, I don't know. You know no, he'll be on the opposite side. Yes, you know, good question. The same question could be asked, if you are making taqlid to a marja, what's the use of all the other ulama like, you know, students like myself? The issue is that, you know, uh, uh, marja can give fatwas, right? And they still can give fatwas. Inshallah, I'll explain tomorrow the difference between marja and wali faqih So then it will become clear that there's only one marja and there's only one wali faqih That inshallah, you know, uh, at first you see that, here's the thing, right? No one chooses wali al No one chooses wali al Wali al is identified, not chosen. Identified by the ulama. Meaning the ulama, they identify who is best qualified amongst us and say that he is the best qualified. Why? Because they look at the qualities that are mentioned, that I'm mentioning right now, in that person. And when they see those qualities in someone, then it's not that they have to choose. No, they don't choose. They say, he's the one. Mushtahad. <laughs> those who are, have done ishtihad. Those who have done ishtihad, meaning that they know Islam. <laughs> they have the knowledge of Islam, of deducing Islam from its sources. Meaning they understood Islam. That's what ishtihad is. That's why I explained ishtihad before. If you go back to the speech that we had on ishtihad, it's on shiatv.net. Look at that speech. There, what is ishtihad? I explained that. Now what ishtihad is, when you reach ishtihad, it's different than other people now. Meaning you have understood Islam, it's haram for you to make a lead of anyone else. But all of us, we are muqalladeen. Meaning we haven't understood Islam. We follow someone who has understood Islam. So those who are mushtahed, those who understand Islam, they need to select and identify the person who has those abilities to become leader. Not marcha, leader.
Yeah, if you go back, you know, one, two, three, we're going one step at a time. So if you look at those speeches, you will see where I'm, I like building the premises for these things. Huh? Yes. Yes. I will explain the role that it has, uh, inshallah, in the speech tomorrow. Right? Leave it for tomorrow. I will explain where it is tomorrow, right? And inshallah, I'll explain it there, right? You want to know where democracy is Islam. In short, let me put it this way, right? The father is the wali of the house. Is he? The wali of the house. The children are under his wilayat. They have to listen to him. Who has the right to make the ultimate decision? The father, okay. Now, if the father says to the children, all right, you know, where do you all want to go? You choose. So the children will have an election, right? And they will say that we want to go here, we want to go there. Under his wilayat, that election is valid. Why? Because if they decide to do something wrong, the father has the right to say, no, you cannot do this. This is where elections are valid in Islam, where there is a wali over the elections. Where there is wilayat over the elections. There is no elections in Islam that chooses the ultimate leader. Choosing an ultimate leader in Islam is invalid, it is wrong. But under a leader, like a father in the house, he can give the choice to the children and say that children, you can choose whatever you decide, I will grant you that. And under his leadership, that election is valid. So let's say in Iran, for example, they have election to choose the president of their country. They can choose the president of their country, have the election and all of that. But that is only valid when Wali of Faqih is there. If the Wali of Faqih, you know, you can't have an election for Wali of Faqih. That is un-Islamic. But under him, you can have many other things. Just like a father in the household. He can give the choice to the children to choose what they want. And that will be right. But they cannot choose having a father or not. Right? They can't choose, okay, you know, we decide not to have you as a father and we'll get another father. <laughs> yes, under Vilayat. Yes. Under. No, he's not chosen. He's not he's identified. See, there's a difference between choosing. Choosing means that, huh? The uh, ulama, the mushtahideen. Those who have knowledge of Islam. Only they can identify a person amongst themselves who has the who has the sifat and the qualities that are necessary for being a leader. Only they can do that, not the people. Right? Only they can do that. Yes. Yes. And that was obvious then because there were two options, you know, that they gave. One was Ayatollah Khamenei, one was Ayatollah Mishkini. Ayatollah Mishkini stepped back and he says, he's more qualified than me. Right? It was understood. Because Imam himself had said that he's the next leader. Imam Khomeini himself had said that he's the next one. So it was obvious, it was clear who's going to be the next one. Yeah, at that time there was no doubt. Yes. Uh, here's the thing, right? I won't say talk. I will say communicates. It's different than talking, right? How does he communicate? I don't know, but it is out of his duties. And inshallah, you know, why? I will explain that because it comes under the subject of Vilayat al Why? Right? It comes under the subject. It is his duty to make sure that Islam is right. That nothing is done, no harm comes to Islam. That is the duty of the Imam. And whoever the leader is that the Shias follow, it is his duty to make sure that the leader does not make a mistake that will harm Islam. That is his duty. Alright. So inshallah, we will end the session here. And we will have, inshallah, uh, the next part tomorrow. Allah bless you all. Salawat alaikum.